been a professional scientist for well over 40 years. All the time I've been a believer, and I'm a biologist, but my expertise really is in the area of reproductive endocrinology. So this issue of sexual reproduction is something that I've grown up with throughout my entire career. And as I will attempt to argue in this talk, uh, the advent of sexual reproduction really is one of the great challenges for Darwinism. And my talk is in basically two parts. The first part, I'm going to consider a survey of reproduction. I'm really going to ask the question, why sex? In the second half of the talk, I'm going to look at the specific issue of male and female and perhaps try to ask or answer the question, how sex? Why sex in the first part? How sex in the second part? So if I move into the first part of the talk, of course our subject is sexual reproduction, but before I get into that, it's necessary really for me to uh, give an overview of asexual reproduction, because when all is said and done, and it's probably true of this room that we're in, there are far more microorganisms, most certainly there are probably more microorganisms on the end of my finger than there are human beings in this room. That doesn't stretch the imagination at all at this point in time. And we need to know that the most prevalent forms of reproduction in life uh, is asexual and of course when you consider the billions and billions of single cell organisms when you consider plants and fungi and also interestingly in the case of some animals you realize that asexual asexual reproduction is far more prevalent actually than sexual reproduction if we consider the microorganisms Generally speaking, they reproduce asexually. They're splitting, and we have two daughter cells that are essentially identical to the parent bacterium. There isn't a strange phenomenon that occurs in microorganisms, which is called bacterial conjugation, where there is a transfer of genetic material from one organism to another. This is called horizontal gene transfer. Is it sexual reproduction? I don't think it is, but it's an interesting alternative to just simple asexual reproduction in microorganisms. Much more interesting, perhaps, is to consider plants. Because many of them, certainly all the plants that I'm going to show here, reproduce asexually. And here you see little plantlets growing off of the parent. They will be identical to the parent. Here you see little leaflets growing off the parent leaf. All of these will be identical to the parent leaf. You've got rhizomes and you've got bulbs. All of this is asexual reproduction. I wonder if you know what this is. Any ideas? This? Well, it isn't Queen Anne's lace, it's a plant called ground elder. Now the reason that I show this is that this was a plague that I had to fight in one of the houses that I owned in the south of London. The garden was covered in ground elder. It's a weed and it has an amazing root system. And my job was to try to extract all the roots from the ground. Easier said than done. If I left any of this root in the ground, almost certainly within a relatively short period of time, the garden would be covered once more in ground elder. This is asexual reproduction. Now this is not a plant, this is an animal, this is a cilentrate, this is the animal hydra, simple animal, and you see it budding. This is asexual reproduction. Eventually, this little hydra is going to break off from the parent. Genetically, it will be identical 
to its parent. This is a nematode worm. These are aphids, little insects. Nematodes and aphids reproduce asexually. Even some lizards, even sharks can reproduce asexually. Now we might term the phenomenon in the lizard and the phenomenon in the shark as parthenogenesis. Sometimes it's a real shock for the keepers in zoos to realize that their sharks have become pregnant when there is no male or female present in that same tank. Inevitably, the baby shark that is born is a female. Interesting thought, but this is asexual reproduction. It is not involving male or female. Anyway, that is <laughs> a very rapid overview of asexual reproduction. You can't really gloss over it because I just repeat the point that I made at the beginning is that in nature, the most prevalent form of reproduction is asexual. However, when we come to consider sexual reproduction, we realize that that is present in virtually all animals and indeed all flowering plants. But this is my uh, thesis. The advent of sex, which is not the most predominant form of reproduction in nature, the advent of sexual reproduction is one, to be perhaps more modest, one of Darwinism's greatest challenges. Why is there sexual reproduction? Now I'm quoting an author, Carl Zimmer. He wrote uh, in 2001, but that book that he wrote, Evolution, the Triumph of, the, of an Idea, has been updated. This uh, quote is still in the new book. Uh, Carl Zimmer is not a creationist, he's definitely an evolutionist, he's not a biologist, he's a writer. But he makes this point. Sex is not only unnecessary, but it ought to be a recipe for evolutionary disaster. This is Carl Zimmer, but what he's saying is absolutely true. It is an inefficient way to reproduce and sex carries other costs as well as a biochemist. I need to uh, tell you that sexual reproduction is extremely costly in terms of biochemical energy. Animal, animals that involve sexual reproduction should be promptly outcompeted by non-sexual ones. This is a fact. Absolutely, this is a fact. And yet Carl goes on to say this, and yet sex reigns. Why is sex a success despite all its disadvantages? And of course this is one of the great unsolved mysteries within biology. And since Darwinian evolution uh, dominates biology, it's not surprising that there have been many attempts by evolutionists to come up with theory why there should be sexual reproduction. The first one, historically I suppose, has been called the lottery principle. The suggestion here is that sexual reproduction introduces variation and since environments are variable, sex should have an advantage. There's only one problem with this idea. The actual opposite is the truth. Because sexual reproduction is far more successful in stable environments. And in the presence of variable environments, the reproductive strategy that is more successful is asexual reproduction. So it's the opposite. Another uh, theory Darwinian theory has been called the tangled bank hypothesis. Quite interesting to real, realize the origin of that title. Well, it's a phrase that comes out of Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species, where he says it is interesting 
to contemplate a tangled bank. Here's a tangled bank. It's got many different types of niches, environments, and the hypothesis would suggest that sexual reproduction will do better in a mixture of environments. Doesn't actually answer any questions, and it is open to the same objections as the lottery principle, as it happens. This has led, this problem, intractical problem in biology, has led an evolutionary biologist, Graham Bell, to say sex is the queen of problems in evolutionary biology. Now, I use that quote because it leads me into another hypothesis that has been proposed to try to understand the advent of sexual reproduction, the Red Queen hypothesis. In fact, in a paper that was published in 2011 in a very prestigious academic journal called Science, an American journal, you have this paper, Running with the Red Queen, Host Parasite Coevolution Selects for Biparental Sex. Now, okay, that's a very technical title. What did they use as their example? They used this nematode worm. The interesting thing, and I've already shown this picture once, the interesting thing about the nematode worm is that it can reproduce sexually and asexually. Very interesting thing. Certain animals are able to do that. And what they've shown absolutely true, is that sexual reproduction does better where there is infection. In the case of the nematode worm, we're talking of parasitic infection. If the nematodes are infected with parasites, those nematodes that reproduce sexually are more successful than those nematodes that reproduce asexually. Why is it called the Red Queen? Well, it's based on a character in Alice Through the Looking Glass. This is the Red Queen. I don't know whether you've seen the film Alice in Wonderland. This is Helena Bonham Carter as the Red Queen. But this is the quote that's taken from the book. Now, here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. There's a competition going on. There's talks about co-evolution of host and parasite. They're competing against each other, almost in a race, and it's necessary to keep up, to keep running on the same spot in order to continue to survive. And since sexual reproduction does better in a situation where you've got parasitic infection, this is why that paper was published in support of the Red Queen hypothesis. However, I do believe that this is included in, um, in something that you could call a Darwinian fairy tale. Now, David Stove, who is a philosopher, wrote this book, and um, he doesn't actually talk about reproduction in the book, so I'm a bit cheeky to use uh, this book as an example, although it's an extremely good book. He is not a creationist, but he is a philosopher, and he considers much of Darwinian theory to be a fairy tale, and I want to apply that title to all of these hypotheses. Is there another hypothesis? Well, actually, there is another hypothesis. This was proposed in 1989 by Bernstein and his co-workers. In fact, in my blue folder, I have a 2011 update of uh, Bernstein et al.'s writing with respect to this hypothesis, the DNA repair hypothesis. This is what they say in this paper in 1989. Our basic hypothesis is that the primary function of sex is to repair the genetic material of the germline. DNA repair. Now, in the process of forming sperm and egg, you have two phenomena. You have recombination, you have repair. 
very much part of the process. Recombination in the formation of sperm and egg allow for variation. This is why you and me are different in our appearance. We're not identical because of this phenomenon of recombination. The repair, what that does is to maintain genomic integrity. This is a theory, it is being presented by evolutionary biology, biologists, but the fact is this, it's not a Darwinian explanation, and I'll try to explain that as I go along. In fact, I would say categorically that DNA repair hypothesis is the very antithesis of Darwinism. Here's a paper that was published in 2011, and you can see um, that there is no support for, seeing, for theories such as the lottery principle or the tangle bank hypothesis because sex reduces genetic variation. This was written in the journal Evolution. We're not talking of a creationist journal here. We're talking of an academic, a secular journal, Evolution. Sex reduces genetic variation. Gorlick and Heng. Now, a commentary on this paper was in the popular press in Science Daily. And this is what it says in that popular commentary. The primary function of sex is not about promoting diversity. This is a really important concept. Rather, it is about keeping the genome, which is the total genetic component of the organism, as, um, this is not creationist talk, folks, as unchanged as possible, maintaining a species identity. Very significant. And then it goes on. In fact, this is quoting Heng, who is one of the co-authors of this paper. If sex was merely for increasing genetic diversity, it would not have evolved in the first place said Heng. This is because asexual reproduction leads to higher rates of genetic diversity than sex. So Darwinism has no answer. It doesn't have any answers when you consider how do we move from something that is incredibly successful, that is asexual reproduction, it is the most predominant form of re reproduction in nature. How do we move from asexual to sexual? Another aspect is how do we move from external to internal fertilization? How do we move from a cold-blooded physiology to a hot-blooded physiology? How do we move from water to land? And I'll just concentrate on that because it introduces one or two other organisms, animals. This is a classical uh, transition from a fish, this is a Darwinian explanation, to an amphibian, ichthyostega, a fish. Going through all these stages, I've given talks on this subject, and there's a lot more that I could say. This is... Uh, a bone of a creature called Tiktaalik, which is included in that transition. But the point that I want to say, is the transition just a matter of bones? Absolutely, it isn't. Please come in, Alex. <laughs> you, swell, you swell the congregation by at least 50%. <laughs> Never mind. I'll give it next year as well. And then maybe more people. It's okay, I don't mind. I like talking, that's, that's the main thing. You know. It's interesting to note, when we consider this transition from water to land, that there are animals that make that transition from water to land every day, and they're known as amphibians. And here we see, I think they're frogs, but they could be toads, I suppose. What do you think, frogs? frogs. <laughs> Well, for amphibians actually display both external and internal fertilization. That's a fact. 
Uh, generally, the eggs are laid in fresh water. That's quite significant, actually, that it would be fresh water. Here you see something that may be quite familiar. This is either frog or toad spawn. This is an interesting one, which is still spawn, amphibian spawn. You see it held in somebody's hand. You see a creature held in the arms of uh, his keeper. This is an amphibian. This is a giant salamander, uh, rather a large creature. Actually, when you think of size, one of the things that you could consider when you think of amphibians is the size of the genome. This is actually interesting when you look right the way down through all the organisms, all the creatures. They all have different genome sizes. If we just focus on this part, ignoring flowering parts just for a minute, although that's very, very interesting, they sometimes have smaller, sometimes very much larger genomes. But if we consider this part of the curve, or the spectrum of genome size, we actually see that amphibians have a very vast range of genome size. Yes, it's true, sometimes quite small, but also it, they can possess very, very much more DNA than, than humans that are stuck in that small distribution. And of course the question is, well, why do amphibians perhaps have more protein coding genes, why could they have vast increase in non-protein coding genes? Well, that's because they're supporting two very different lifestyles, of course. In water it would be gills, on land they'd be having lungs and breathing air. This interesting uh, phenomenon where you, you can't build an evolutionary scheme where you're going from a small genome to a large genome is called the C-value paradox. But the fact is amphibians don't have genes for everything. This is a little reptile. I think it's a turtle. It's coming out of an egg. The egg is called an amniotic egg. And here's a schematic of the amniotic egg, and it's got an impervious shell. All right, water uh, doesn't have access to the inside. So it needs a food supply, and it needs to be able to deal with waste. So it's a very complex structure. Obviously the amphibian doesn't have an amniotic egg. And of course birds lay amniotic eggs, so you know what's coming next. What's the question that we need to ask? What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Interesting thought. It's not a trivial question. This is part of the mystery of sex. If you think of the amniotic egg, that's not the only thing you've got to think of. You've got to think of the machine that produces the amniotic egg. Whether that be in a reptile or in a bird. Actually, some mammals lay eggs, which is an interesting thought. So if we think about that for a moment, how can the structure of the amniotic egg arise in a stepwise manner? We have to think about it. All right? Frog spawn, hang on, laid in fresh water. How, how are we going to have a system that will enable the organism or the animal to lay eggs outside of water altogether. But of course it needs the internal physiology to create the amniotic egg. How can that arise in a stepwise manner? It's an important consideration. And why, again, just as if asexual reproduction is the most predominant form of, sex of reproduction in nature, why then should there be sexual reproduction in the first place? If asexual reproduction is so successful, why should this take place? The development of the amniotic egg and its machinery that produces it, why should this actually happen when amphibious physiology is so successful? So that is the first part of the talk. It is a very rapid overview. 
we haven't we haven't found an evolutionary explanation why sexual reproduction should have existed. We can't answer the question from an evolutionary perspective, why sex? So I want to move on to the second part of the talk where I'm going to consider how sex, and in particular consider this issue of male and female. And in so doing, we raise more questions that Darwin cannot answer. In fact, when I consider this second part, and the title being The Mystery of Sex, I could rename the second part of the talk The Mystery of Six. And that gives me another hypothesis to work on, which is now the White Queen Hypothesis. This is me talking, you know, I'm not going to find this in the literature, I just think it's good. Through the looking glass quote of the White Queen. Sometimes I've believed in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. That's what she says. And I want to give you six impossible things. When you consider interaction between male and female. The first one is physical compatibility. You think, oh, that's obvious. Well, these two creatures have the same genome. They've got the same genetic material within each of their cells, but it's expressed very differently between the Chihuahua and the Great Dane. And when we consider physical compatibility, our Chihuahua says, this is not a trivial matter. <laughs> However, using in vitro fertilization, one could obtain a hybrid, and I'm sure it's been done, between the Chihuahua and the Great Dane, because their genome, certainly from a chromosomal structure point of view, they're very essentially identical. And so they are... Uh, they could produce offspring that are also fertile. Uh, what would you do, though? You would make sure that this was the boy and this was the girl. <laughs> Physically, a chihuahua, I don't think, could carry even a hybrid. I don't think. I don't think. Physical compatibility. Well, there's some other points. Physiological complexity needs to be taken into account. There are incredible biochemical obstacles. There's an issue of immunological tolerance. So um, what species shall I use as my example here? Well, I think we need to go for the human situation. This young woman reminds me of Victoria Beckham. I don't know whether you agree with me. <laughs> This is supposed to be Adam and Eve, of course. So it's in the human. Let's, let's look at what, what is the difference between human males and human females. Well, in order to do that, we've got to take a journey into the cell. The nucleated cell, into the heart of the cell is the nucleus. And in the heart of the nucleus, you have these little structures that you can see at certain times of the cell cycle, which are called chromosomes. This is interesting. This is a karyotype of a human female. You see that there are 22 pairs, true pairs, of chromosomes which are called autosomes. And there's these two slightly larger chromosomes when you consider some of these tiny ones, which are the sex chromosomes. In the case of the female, they are a two pair. They're X and X. Two X chromosomes. They're the sex chromosomes in the human female. So what about the male? Well, in terms of all that 22 pairs of chromosomes, you will see that men and women are the same. However, if you look at the sex chromosomes, you see that they are now unpaired. Unpaired. X and Y. Most of us, the majority of us, 
in this room have a Y chromosome. One person doesn't. <laughs> Actually, it's really worth thinking about. We thought about the um, just the advent of sexual reproduction being uh, an unsolved problem. The existence of the Y chromosome is also a mystery. Now, as I put in the notes for my other talk, one of the things that greatly encourages me when I give talks like this is that in the months, sometimes the weeks, in fact, in this instance, in the days before I have to give a talk, something is brought to my attention that really supports the arguments that I'm trying to make. And this happened on the 24th of April, which is just over a month ago, a whole issue of the journal Nature was dedicated to the Y chromosome. And it's got here, you can't read it, reasons for why. There's a mystery about the Y chromosome. Now, the fact is this, in, evol in the evolutionary world, the Y chromosome is thought to have evolved, if you like, perhaps devolved is the right word, from a duplicate X. Now, I've put that in inverted commas because the, the academic literature might not call it a duplicate X because what they're suggesting here is that it's come from a, the 23rd pair of autosomes. And I'm not making this up because this was one of the papers in this issue of Nature. It's got a very complex title. Please come and join us and swell the numbers. <laughs> um, that's very d technically difficult, that title. So I'm just going to extract a little bit from the abstract. The human X... Now you want to, I mean, this is academic scientists writing this. Come on, they're not creationists, they're academic scientists, evolutionary biologists, okay? The human X and Y chromosomes evolved from an ordinary pair of autosomes. Remember, we have 22 pairs of autosomes, which is common between male and female. Women have a 23rd pair, XX. Men have unpaired XY. The human X and Y chromosomes evolved from an ordinary pair of autosomes, but millions of years ago, genetic decay ravaged, well, the Y chromosome. It stripped it right back. Took out everything that it didn't need. And only 3% of its ancestral genes survived. Now, what are the ancestral genes? Those are the common genes that an X carries and a Y carries. 3% of the total genome. The X chromosome's got 97% of genes that are not on the Y chromosome. And vice versa. There are many genes on the Y chromosome that are not on the X chromosome. In other words, X and Y have different sets of genes. It's a problem. Where do the novel, unique genes come from? This is the same paper, just another point. Our findings indicate that survival was non-random. I mean, that's interesting. And in two cases, convergent across placental mammals and marsupial mammals. They're the what? Marsupial mammals are the mammals that have got pouches. Placental mammals, you know, have got the internal placenta. We propose that beyond its roles in testis determination and spermatogenesis, the Y chromosome is essential for male viability. 
Well, that's really worth thinking about, isn't it? Because what are we saying about male viability in the transition period? It doesn't exist. It needs to be a fully functioning Y chromosome in order for there to be male viability. In fact, that's highlighted in a commentary in the same journal, and of course it's got a very interesting title, The Vital Y Chromosome. This is what he says. The authors show that in, although there was a period of rapid degeneration and gene loss during its early evolution, the genes that are conserved across the Y chromosomes of extant living mammals have since been remarkably stable. It's a very interesting statement. Why do they say there was rapid gene loss? Yeah. Correct. <laughs> it has to happen very quickly. It's got to be rapid. Why are the Y chromosome genes stable across living species? We have to have them. They're common to all the different species, largely. There's a lot that's not common, but genes, a very small percentage of the total. But this is the point. How do you achieve fertility without fully functional sex chromosomes? How do you do it? You see, if you're not an evolutionist, at least the blinkers are taken off and you've got the opportunity to look this way and that way. If you're an evolutionist, you've got blinkers on. You can't see anything other. And what becomes interesting science can easily slip into total nonsense when you look at it objectively. It's still a mystery, the Y chromosome. This is really interesting. I find it interesting. I hope other people do. There is a specific gene that's not present on the X, but present on the Y, which is called the SRY gene. It imposes maleness. What do I mean by that? The absence of the SRY gene leads to the development of a female. If it's not there, and of course it won't be there, if the embryo has two X chromosomes and will develop into a little girl, but in the absence of the SRY gene, inevitably there will be the development of a female, and interestingly, the female form of the embryo is the ground state. Quite what theological implications that has, I don't know. But having said that, the presence of the SRY gene, which will only be present in the presence of a Y chromosome leads to the development of a male. Why? Because of a chain reaction that leads to an increase in testosterone, male sex hormone. It does not to say that females don't have testosterone, they do, but at a much lower concentration. Men have a much higher concentration of testosterone, leads to strength, leads to virilization. Basically, of a female embryo. I want you to watch this schematic. You see, I'm going to show it twice because you'll miss it the first time round. From the same embryonic structures, in the presence of testosterone, you get the formation of a testis. In the absence of testosterone, you get the formation of an ovary. Let's see if we can go back and show it again. We start with the same embryonic structures. In the presence of testosterone, you get the formation of a testis, embryonically. In the absence of the SRY gene and much lower levels of testosterone, you get the formation of the ovary. For me, this is incredible. This is incredible design, incredible design sexual differentiation but from the same embryonic structures and without going into all the details that's true for both internal and external sexual organs from the same embryonic structures separation 
but with perfect compatibility. It's incredible. Now I'm going to show you a clip. Uh, it's my only video clip, but it's, this is Michael Mosley, he's British, and this was on the, on the BBC, which was a series called Inside the Human Body, and it shows the wonder of human fertilization. Going back to this uh, journal that was published just a month ago, it uh, speaks about uh, two factors that are involved in fertilization. They've got strange names, Juno and Izumo or Izumo. This is a female factor, Juno. Female mice lacking Juno are infertile. The presence of Juno is essential for mammalian fertilization. This is on the surface of the sperm. Here you see the protein, and here you see the receptor on the egg. And in fact, what they show in this commentary on that original paper, sperm protein finds its mate, is that at fertilization, when one of those sperms penetrates the egg and fertilizes the egg, the receptor, Juno, is ejected. That's in addition to that amazing release of granules, because it's absolutely vital that no more than one sperm gets into that egg and there's incredible mechanisms for that. Izumo is a specific cell surface protein on the sperm. Juno is, a, is its specific cell surface protein receptor on the egg. The question, of course, is, is one any good without the other? The obvious answer is no. Every male and female factor has to be in place for there to be successful fertilization and fertility. And yet, in the evolutionary world, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things. Before breakfast we dealt with four, there are two others that we need to deal with quickly because the time's moving on. One is environmental factors, because if we look at these sexual strategies, you see that um, male and female are attracted to one another through these various courtship strategies. That's one thing, and you can see that in many, many different species, of course, not just birds. This is sometimes incredible, where certain flowering plants and flowering plants such as these reproduce sexually require specific types of insect. And there is this symbiosis between very different species here, plants and insects. I showed two elephants here, but I could extend this to nearly every species that reproduces sexually. There are things, chemical signals, we heard about one in that video clip, that the egg sends out a chemical signal to wake up those sleeping sperm. You could call them pheromones. They're very species-specific. The last part of my talk really is also a little bit technical because I want to talk about genomic barriers. As I think we have seen and the academic press supports, all sexual reproduction involves the maintenance of chromosomal integrity. And the reason is very clear. On February the 16th, 2001, was a very significant day in biology because uh, concurrently the most prestigious journal in England, Nature, the most prestigious academic journal in America, Science, published the draft of the human genome, February the 16th, 2001. But in the science paper, there was another paper which spoke about human DNA repair genes. At that time, there were 130 known human DNA repair genes. This is machinery to repair any 
um, breakdown of DNA. And since then, very many more systems have been discovered. They're incredibly costly from a biochemical energy perspective, but there are extensive correction mechanisms for, for any error. It appears absolutely vital to maintain the total integrity of the DNA. And of course, we're reminded of the DNA repair hypothesis. Something to think about. Any disruption to chromosomal integrity inevitably leads to disease and death. The current academic literature is filled with examples of that. And we are discovering that all living organisms have complex protein machines that maintain the total integrity of chromosomes during cell division. And this has got profound implications as far as sexual reproduction is concerned. We need to understand a little bit in closing about the formation of sperm and egg. There are two types of cell division. Cell division of our normal cells is called mitosis, but the cell division that leads to production of sperm and egg is called meiosis. It's a reduction cell division with respect to the number of chromosomes. Formation of sperm and egg. Remember, the parent cells in the human have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And you can see that here. In total, 46 chromosomes, but 23 pairs. Sperm and egg have half that number. Here you see the ovum and also the sperm have 23 individual chromosomes. Why? It's because of fertilization. At fertilization, the total complement is going to be restored. 23 individual chromosomes in sperm and egg combine to form the 23 pairs of chromosomes in the normal cell. Now this process of meiosis begins by pairing homologous chromosomes. What are homologous chromosomes? Well, I've just said 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each pair has got to get its act together and they pair up. This process is extremely precise. There are two chromosomes, for, there are two copies of each chromosome. One is from the father and one from the mother. Meiosis cannot start, this is really important, meiosis cannot start until those pairs are zipped together. Actually, interestingly, the X and the Y unpaired chromosomes in the male are zipped end to end. And this process, which is called synapsis, is very complex and very accurate. And this is a beautiful picture, well I think it is. This is the zipping together of the homologous chromosomes. They're already beginning to divide, interestingly. That's why they have this appearance. But they're zipped together. This is another picture in an academic journal of what is known as the synaptonemal complex. This is a very significant paper. This was in Nature Reviews in Genetics. This isn't a creationist journal. Published in March 2009. Look at the title. The Consequences of Asynapsis for Mammalian Meiosis. That's the formation of sperm and egg. This is what they say. Let's just highlight some words. Errors in chromosome synapsis associated with impaired fertility, and with high levels of asynapsis, sterility is seen in both sexes. Synapsis, if it can't happen, you will never get viable sperm and egg, and there will be sterility. Something to think about. Meiosis cannot happen, cannot begin, without that process of the pairing of homologous chromosomes. 
Synapsis cannot happen without the maintenance of chromosomal integrity. It can't. That's why DNA repair is so significant. That's why the cell goes overboard to maintain its genomic integrity. If there is no meiosis, there is no sperm or egg. If there's no meiosis, there is no survival. So the question that I ask, and I like this mantra, is it the survival of the fittest, which is a Darwinian term? Actually not. It is the survival of the fertile. So in conclusion, Darwinism has no credible answers to the existence of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction needs perfect compatibility with all those different things included between male and female counterparts. Sexual reproduction requires the maintenance of genomic and chromosomal integrity and the cell goes overboard to do that. And because of that, this is the very antithesis of Darwinism that demands total plasticity of the genome. Darwinism, Darwinism and the maintenance of fertility are mutually exclusive concepts. And that's one of the reasons why I feel it's one of the greatest challenges to Darwinism. So what does the Bible say at the very end? It says in Mark, this is the words of Jesus, that at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. True of Adam and Eve, of course, it's true of all sexually reproducing organisms. God made the wild animals, this is just an example, Genesis 1 verse 25, according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds. I want to just highlight those words because this motif is repeated ten times in Genesis chapter 1. It's very interesting when you come to see the Hebrew of this text because the word for kind is the Hebrew word mean. Mem, Yud, Nun. Mean, and in modern Hebrew, that means sex. Very interesting. According to sex, according to sex. And God saw that it was good. And the fact is this, this is the mystery of sex.